You're listening to a Meat Smith Harvest. This is the podcast that encourages and equips you to grow your home around the harvest. This Farmstead Meat Smith production is made possible by you. If you like it, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating at a level you'd enjoy giving at. Your gift helps us increase the quality and quantity of all our free media education. Thank you and happy harvesting. Good afternoon. Meet Smiths. Good afternoon, Brandon. Hi. Thanks for sitting down with me again today. Thanks for sitting down with me. <laughs> we live everywhere. We're good. Hello, mm-hmm. Instagram. Thanks for watching us and Facebook followers. Um, Desmond. Yep. Good to see your. What is that called? <laughs> Avatar. Is that the old word for it now? I don't know. Is it outdated? Mm, meme icon. Digital designation of presence. <laughs> we have uh, so much to talk about. It's spring, finally. Spring has sprung. We're recording this, what, April 1st? Yep. So No uh, joke. <laughs> and we have a lot to talk about. I think, actually, we might splice this episode in before the other ones that we've recorded. So, again, we're going out of order. Oh. Um, just because what we want to talk about today is so relevant to right now. Yeah. So our normal pace of getting these out a couple months late, I would like to try to not do because what are we talking about today? Uh, home education. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) It's so relevant because, um, we do it and also... The world is doing it right now. Yeah. It's kind of forced, foisted, mm-hmm. forced, foisted upon many of us. Yeah. So everyone and their mother is talking about it right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we both thought, let's, let's put in our two cents. Yeah. yeah. Basically, homeschooling your children is a crisis. <laughs> and the best way <laughs> to prepare for a crisis is to live in perpetual crisis. <laughs> that way... You're not surprised. <laughs> you're ac- you're yeah, absolutely right. No, you're right. It's something like that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that is the last crisis, I think, in our lifetime was the recession. Mm-hmm. And, um, right? 2008? Yeah. Was that, that, right? that was kind of the last crisis, real, real mm-hmm. catastrophe. People were out of work. The things that seemed stable vanished we're no longer stable i remember before 2008 my uh forays into farming and working for small farms and not really making any money but just a little tiny bit Mm -hmm. was reckless and irresponsible considering i was newly married and planning on Mm -hmm. having a family Mm -hmm. and starting a family uh but then after the crisis when all those jobs that were previously considered stable just evaporated. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, I wasn't so such a ding dong anymore because <laughs> I was still in. I was still working. Uh, That's right. Because there is this resiliency in small businesses, and I guess, and you know, there's also fragility there. But working for these small farms, and by small, I mean like you know, they're run by basically one guy, one person, yeah. one woman, and two three seasonal helpers so very very small but they are you know small family operations but also legitimately sustaining themselves by uh the products that they sell Mm -hmm. so they are not it's not some you know non-profit wiggle thing Mm -hmm. or uh some heavily subsidized small farming endeavor or it's actually like they're they're making a living off of what they sell and those people and all small business owners are already out of work Mm -hmm. sort of all the time it's this kind of this state of being wherein 
And I remember this growing up. My dad was a general contractor. He's a builder. My mom had a few small businesses. And uh, uncertainty about the future, complete uh, a future utterly void of uh, income. When you're looking at like, uh, we have no jobs. There is no pennies in the future. <laughs> None. Yeah. That's actually kind of common. Mm-hmm. That's that's actually standard operating procedure for small businesses. You're used to scratching out your living. Yeah. Yeah. And so crises like this are super intense, like this being the coronavirus pandemic. Um, they're they're very freaky, but there's a sense in which at least so far, they're of the same order of magnitude for small business owners as a semi-standard crisis that they might experience throughout the year. Personally, serious illness, Mm -hmm. serious childbirth, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, you know, uh, a very essential and expensive pieces of a piece of equipment breaks. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, because your whole basis of economy is home-based anyway. So we home birth typically, home school, home um, home business, you know, family business. We work out of our home. Yeah. Um, Gosh, there's a few others I could think of. You know, we grow a lot of our food at home. Mm -hmm. We're good on the meat side of things. Yeah. So... We haven't felt it quite as much. There are still some scary things we're dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, our our whole domestic economy is still dependent upon infrastructure. Yeah. Like electricity, gasoline, and such. Yeah. And buying animal feed. We yeah. haven't completely closed that circle at all. I mean, people do consider us an essential business. So... Yeah. Um, I would say maybe one third of our income because we, you know, our business relies on a number of different activities. Mm -hmm. And so when one kind of falls flat, we can kind of rely on the others to sustain us. And so that's what we're doing right now. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to make it, it's going to be okay. Yeah. But it has also actually sparked new conversations between us. Right. That we're like. We should get a cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that is the other thing that small business owners do and that we have done is essentially totally, well, maybe this is just what I do and more intelligent business owners don't do this, but reinvent the business every year. Mm-hmm. It's true. You know, yeah. you're just in a constant state of response and flux to crises, to slow periods. And we've gotten better at not having the adrenaline rushed mm. like fight or flight response the panic yeah yeah we're just sort of, it's just par for the course it's kind okay, of par we're gonna yeah. have to shift you know right yeah um we still have our moments but it you get used to yeah. just adjusting mm-hmm. and and because maybe we've done that already we haven't felt it it's been it's been okay you know here yeah. at the home base yeah. Because we're well, already based at home so much. Right. Our day to day schedule hasn't really changed. No. At all. Not that much. I mean, we can't go to mass on Sunday. That's rough. That's the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. That's our big public public masses are not happening. Yeah. But um, other than that, we are we're at home all the time. Mm-hmm. Basically. Yeah. So we're kind of stuck with each other's all the time. <laughs> That's right. So we kind of have to learn yeah. to live with our other's yeah. all the time. Yeah. Anyway, and we were saying this morning how we could not do it if we didn't have just a little bit of space. We have two and a half acres here on Vashon. Yeah. And without that, we're imagining being, you know, in a nice neighborhood home in Tacoma or something mm-hmm. in the suburb, but with a small yard. Mm-hmm. And... That that would be very tough mm-hmm. to be quarantined in that situation with a lot of kids. With all of our kids, yeah, yeah. But our kids, it's so it's uh, it is a great um, consolation to see them outside right now in the midst of what's going on in the world, just playing mm-hmm. like they usually do mm-hmm. with themselves. They've got their own little society, 
it's a little, uh, you know, it's a little survival of the fittest, and <laughs> yeah, it can be brutal sometimes. But, you know, it's already it's dog good. eat dog for them. It <laughs> is, yeah. There are that's how they roll, but they yeah. they have a good time with each other. They do a really good time. You know, they they need a plank of wood and some dirt, <laughs> and they're good. Yeah, that's like <laughs> yeah. Maybe some bikes. You yeah. know, we've given them some good bikes. They do have nice, nice bikes. Yeah. Yeah. And they use them and we frequently banish them. Oh, yeah. Which is another good strategy. It's it's shameless banishment to the outdoors. Yeah. I mean, I lock the door and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For their, their sake and ours and for the sake of the drywall and <laughs> things that are not, you know, rocks in the home. Yeah. Like they won't destroy the foundation. That's solid. But... <laughs> You know, when they get cabin fever and they're bouncing off the walls, it's... Rain or shine, they yeah. go out. Yeah, they go out. That's right. Get your muck boots on, put yeah. your gym shorts on. <laughs> muck boots and gym shorts. Get out in that hail right now, boy. Yeah, and they don't... <laughs> I'm from Southern California, so I have five layers of wool on for most of the year, and I'm freezing <laughs> almost all the time. But the kiddos, they... Yeah. They don't even notice because mm-hmm. they're all Vashon born Pacific Northwest kids. Mm-hmm. They don't even notice. In fact, we are telling them in the cold wet to put shoes on <laughs> when they go outside. Yeah. They're just out here in their socks. <laughs> or barefoot. I know. <laughs> in the mud. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So the kids are doing great. Yeah. They're doing good. Our parents have my parents have been hit. I don't know how your parents are doing, but I guess they've they've taken on some added burdens too because their yeah. their labor force has kind of abandoned them. I think. Yeah. Um, I don't mean that in a bad way, but mm-hmm. it's just you know that's the reality. Um, and then, but my parents have been hit pretty hard, so they've been home a lot because they mm-hmm. had a lot of jobs planned. They always have a big spring, and they're very event based, mm-hmm. and so and their events got canceled, and they were really playing on a lot of income. So they're home. Which means they're a hundred yards away from our house. They're, yeah, yeah. They're very That's close. been probably the biggest adjustment yeah. for me in my mm-hmm. life. You know, just having grandpa around, mm-hmm. which is great. You know, but the kids are like constantly distracted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where's grandpa? Mm-hmm. So, but it has been good to just have that. Yeah, that element. Yeah, that's definitely a characteristic of our home life and what we've learned over the years, mostly the hard way is the importance of an ordered daily agenda. Yeah. That we stick to like it's law. And yeah. I think that is really helpful and I could see how if your kids are at home for the first time in a long time because of the quarantine and they're just kind of like hanging out and there's no it's casual in a way, there's no order. Mm-hmm. There's no calendar for the day. That could get, that is hard. Yeah. And things can devolve. Mm -hmm. You know, things tend to devolve. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might seem superfluous and ancillary and an arbitrary imposition of order. But man, Mm -hmm. that daily schedule, waking up at the consistent time and having specific tasks and chores that have to be performed at a specific time, Mm -hmm. scheduling in quiet times. And banishment outside Mm -hmm. as a matter of a schedule. Mm -hmm. It actually is huge Mm -hmm. in terms of keeping people happy. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's Mm -hmm. like direct, it's super practical. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, actually. So you're getting into more of technical language here, actually, for homeschool moms. So I wouldn't actually call it a schedule. Oh. And because there are schools of thought amongst moms, like Mm. how how you order your day and there are those that are completely unstructured like right. whatever happens happens mm-hmm. and on the other end of the spectrum is the uber structured mm-hmm. um scheduled mm-hmm. mom so we always have lunch right at twelve fifteen or mm-hmm. whatever it is and i can't do that so much because i would have to be a tyrant mm-hmm. and i don't want to do that because mm-hmm. i have done that and it doesn't work <laughs> just putting that out there um so I do more of a rhythm, kind of in the middle, 
between the unstructured and the scheduled. Mm -hmm. So I do have a specific order that things have to happen. That's in, what I was going to say. It's but an I order don't, of events. Yes. Yeah. I don't attach it to the clock so to much. To the time. Yeah. yeah. And if I need to just skip over something once in a while to catch up with my day, or uh -huh. we're having dinner at 9, 9 p.m., yeah. then I will. But like the rhythm method, what I would call it that. <laughs> That's something totally different. <laughs> Woo. Not yeah. that. Um, Having, okay, so first we're going to do this. And I we usually get up around six or seven. And mm -hmm. then first we do this. And then after that's done, then we go to, you know, the plan B. And then after plan B is done, then it's plan C. And yeah. each of these things might take 15 minutes or they might take 45 minutes, you know. Right. But having them in that logical order at least keeps the kids on a, yeah. they know what to expect, even though they're not watching the clock like I usually am. Yeah. So... That's been liberating to find that happy medium. Yeah, because it it seems like it's uh, it 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 achieves two things with the kids that can be at cross purposes. One is that they learn discipline, meaning that they just learn how to uh, not be completely enslaved to their own desires every second. Exactly. They learn yeah. that uh, well. There's things I have to do. I have obligation and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes them free. Mm -hmm. All they do anyway is ask for responsibility. Can I cook it, Dad? Can I, you know? It's true, they, yeah. Can I shoot the pig? Or, you know, they <laughs> almost. Yeah. They, they, they want that. They desire that. And so giving them that discipline is really good. But then at the same time, a central part of homeschooling and learning is being able to seize those opportunities when they are receptive or when Wallace or Johnny or any of them are particularly engaged with a thing, mm -hmm. piano or reading or something that you're doing with them. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's the case? Mm -hmm. So that you can, there's still this order in the day, but you could take twice as long with one of those things yeah. if the opportunity presents itself. Absolutely. Yeah. And all the stars align and Therese is calm mm -hmm. and Bia is not giggling in uh, such a high voice that the glass is cracking all throughout the house <laughs> and you know there's yeah. just this moment where the stars align you can do this with wallace yeah right now mm -hmm. and so you take it mm -hmm. as a result the whole day isn't thrown off right it's just the shifting order of events mm -hmm. seems like yeah it allows definitely for taking that moment yeah to smell the roses as it were even it's your child you know yeah you got to take those moments yeah. Well. Well, and because a lot of those moments are uh, projects outside. Mm, mm -hmm. right i mean if yeah. i'm killing a pig in the driveway that's a moment that disrupts the day it is yeah that all the kids yeah they, i just have an audience mm -hmm. they all want to watch mm -hmm. or what else you know if we if we're bucking firewood if there's these outdoor mm -hmm. projects that are going on yeah um which yeah. are not outside the realm of homeschooling that is mm -hmm. that is that is it. That is their schooling. That is their schooling. Yeah. You know, we were, Wallace, our kids have known how to start fires from very young. Mm -hmm. um, and cooking over them. Yeah. I mean, that's part, part right. of it. Wielding an axe yeah. safely. They, you know, I mean, they learned that right away. Yeah. They, very young. Exactly. And if I had had such tight reins, like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. We school from nine to noon every day. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that you do that's cool from yeah. nine to noon every day. Right. Um, and so what, another thing that I've learned to do is you build in a lot of free time. Yeah. And so I don't actually know how long we school every day. Yeah. But it's like, it, it is um, pretty close to like 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, 20 minutes on, 20 yeah. minutes, or sometimes 40 minutes off, you know? Right. Um. But kids need that kind of rhythm too. Yeah. They need to be uber focused and tight centered on something small and right in front of them. 
And then they need to like have their minds expanded and opened and they need to run outside and yeah. find dad, you know, killing a pig mm-hmm. or something and and be outside and forget all about math, you know. Mm-hmm. And then they need to be reined in again. Mm-hmm. And they're actually quite okay with it. Mm-hmm. Their brain is structured to be, uh, I don't want to say interrupted, but they like that to and fro and yeah. stop and go. Yeah. You know, it's a... It's a natural rhythm, yeah. and we do, we need it too. Actually, I it depends on your personality, but you know we can focus a lot longer mm-hmm. if we need to for an hour or three hours at a time if we absolutely need to. But even then, we gotta change it up. Yeah. And so that's that's a really big thing for me is um, focus time for a short length of time, yeah. twenty minutes at the most. Maybe thirty if I'm if I need to with one of my older ones, but definitely no one younger eight should have anything focused for longer than twenty minutes. Yeah, that's too much for their brains. It they is. get when when they get that glassy eyed look. Oh, it's over. You're done. You've you've actually hurt them. Yeah, <laughs> I mean not. I don't mean that really, but you've you've actually taken away education at that point. Yeah. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you've make you've made it burdensome. Yeah, yeah. To learn. So to that end, yeah, I'm constantly. What were you gonna say? No, it just becomes burdensome to learning. And I was trying to remember a great Jane Austen quote Hmm. from her Mansfield novel, but it's Mm. escaping me. It's the effect of education, I suppose. Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. which is just, uh, man. If there's one thing to kill natural or to kill learning kill the intellect sometimes it's education yeah that'll do it yeah and that's why i think it's helpful particularly for people that are getting into it for the first time uh to know that the schooling doesn't stop Mm -hmm. tactically i mean not ever but it doesn't stop during those 20 minute intervals those breaks oh absolutely not yeah it's not like it ceases and that it's just random crazy time and that the brain is like a balloon with a mm-hmm. hole in it. Mm-hmm. And that you're just filling it with air. And anytime you're not blowing into it, all the knowledge and information is leaking out and they're becoming ding-dongs. It's like, <laughs> no, that's not how it works at all. That's when it sinks in. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I perceive the whole, uh, also just the ordering of the day. Like you were saying, those order of events. And the three meals that we've talked about, Mm -hmm. sitting down as a family and eating together the fruit of our toil, Mm -hmm. eating what we produce and, or what we even just prepare, just preparing a meal together. Mm -hmm. Um, All of that is schooling Mm -hmm. and how to live with people Mm -hmm. in a salubrious way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's essential life skills. And it is it's in that broader context of daily life that they are learning the most essential lessons, far more important than the sheer download of information. Yeah. Is the disciplining, mm-hmm. the, them gaining the ability to, to have mastery of themselves. Yeah. And that's what they learn in an, in an ordered day mm-hmm. like that. And it is a constant battle. Oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. Because they, all of their passions are awakening in them yeah and they're very strong and it, so much of discipline is just making them aware of like see how you're obsessing over this thing right now and it's making you absolutely miserable and everyone else around <laughs> you and it's leading to fighting and anger and mm-hmm. so many bad things mm-hmm. if we can just control that passion then it'll be smooth sailing yeah we'll be good yeah um, so that's what's being learned just in the context of a, of that domestic society yeah. of a family. Yeah. And I'm so glad they have each other yeah. for that. I'm so glad that the older kids have the burden of their younger siblings. Yeah, totally. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Lest. Yeah. I just think it's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, you grew up being homeschooled. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was going to a private school up until second grade. So I guess that means I went through first grade. And I don't really have very many memories of it other than 
being grossed out by other kids. <laughs> I have a, this is a problem of my personality. I have a very high disgust sensitivity. <laughs> and my memories are of what went on in the bathrooms, in the urinals with the other little boys. And I just remember being so shocked. I was like, I can't, what, what is wrong with you all? This is... Little boys like what ours are now. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So I had the sons exactly like the kids that used to flip me out, that used to gross me out. Those are my sons. And I think I'm just a weird, I was a weird, neat, but I'm, I'm a slob. I'm not a, I'm not a organized person. So I don't know what my thing was, but I just remember being <laughs> grossed out by them. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mind school, but it was my dad who just decided one day, like, why I kind of, I... I, he perceived me as his responsibility. Mm -hmm. He gave me life, so he wanted to give me education also. Mm -hmm. And uh, both my parents just had the confidence that they could do that. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because according to whatever standard they had all these academic degrees. My dad did do posts, uh, uh, you know, postgraduate work. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, my mom didn't go to college or anything and... They didn't have any of those normal reasons that would necessarily qualify them as a teacher, mm -hmm. other than their uh, fathering and mothering. Mm. They had children, mm -hmm. and that was sufficient. They felt like they could, we can do this, we mm. can educate our mm -hmm. son. So they just brought me home, and uh, my mom definitely went through the learning curve that a lot of beginning parents do, and I was the oldest, so I was the experiment case, and I have two younger sisters. But, you know, you, you tend to start very rigorous and feeling obliged to imitate the school system, mm -hmm. um, which for, for all that it might provide, it, it is, uh, you know, kind of an, uh, not really a debatable fact that the school system is designed to educate children for factory labor. Mm. Um, that, that's kind of the structure of it. And there's lots of alternative schools that are departing from that model, of course, but um, the segregation along age brackets and everything and the, uh, anyway, and there's really no more factories anymore. So it's mm. kind of a weird, Interesting. silly dinosaur left over in the school system mm. structure. Um, and it's easy to feel obligated to try to keep up with that. Yeah. Particularly like, oh no, my son isn't reading and he's nine, mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and so my mom definitely went through that. Lots of pressure there. But then she found a community of uh, homeschoolers mm -hmm. who were like, yeah, my kid's 13 and he was started reading like last week. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, really? <laughs> you know? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it was very much... And it wasn't just, oh, so don't worry about it. Lower your standards. It was more like, yeah. it's kind of actually the same thing you hear. Uh, when you start to look into home birth, it's like, no, nah, actually, you were kind of, kind of made for this. Yeah. You can do this. You're, yeah. this isn't an illness. This isn't something contrary to what you are biologically equipped to accomplish. And the same goes for educating it does. kiddos. I think there's, you can do it. Being a mother and father does qualify you, right? Like there's that there's that skit from um, Monty Python. Mm. And it's about birthing. Oh. And the doctor said, the mom says, what am I supposed to do? Because she's hooked up to all these machines. Yeah. And he goes, nothing. You're not qualified. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's almost like that with education. Like, no, yeah. don't do anything. You're not qualified. Yeah. But I would say that yeah. in the natural order of things, which we're all about the natural order here at Firms yeah. and Meatsmith, in yeah. every aspect of life, um, you are qualified. Yeah. And we don't need to say, even though I'm about to say it, that this bars like really horrible disorder in the household. Like if you're both drug addicted parents and abusive and there's horrible things going on in the house, probably not <laughs> the best at homeschooling your kids. Right. So you might have to take care of some self care first. Y yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, obviously. But we don't need to say all that, right? <laughs> we get that? How many people do you know you would say truly share your back to the land values? Or your passion for home scale craft meat curing? 
or simply love the multifaceted beauty of a good meal as obsessively as you do? Maybe a handful? At farmsteadmeetsmith.com, we've created an online community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world and a platform for them to learn from and inspire one another. In addition to our major semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Pacific Northwest homestead, over at farmsteadmeetsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources years deep now for you to dive deeper into your food journey with. And both our classes and online program include access to our private community Facebook page for your continued education and fellowship. We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeetsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you, putting the knife in your hand, article by article, and comment thread by comment thread, and can support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. So uh, I was talking about my mom though. She, yeah. yeah, so it was a, it was definitely for a while for me, sit down with the workbook and go through it. Mm-hmm. And that almost killed my brain. It almost turned it into scrambled eggs That's because right. I just hated it because it seemed useless. And to this day, if I don't, know the end principle for doing a thing i cannot do it i like can't overcome (laughs) why am i doing this yeah i just can't do it it's really hard for me uh so and that's how it felt sitting down with Mm. a becca saxon math in particular Mm. Mm -hmm. and so my mom you know was receptive and like wow this is miserable we're just like trudging through these workbooks and homeschooling Mm -hmm. is the worst thing ever Mm -hmm. And so once she kind of figured out to just let go of that arbitrary standard that is imposed by Mm -hmm. um, a school system understanding of education, and she just then focused on me as her individual son, Mm -hmm. uh, that's when my education took off. Mm -hmm. And she was like, okay, we're just going to stop math like for a long time (laughs) because (laughs) this is horrible. And so we did, and she yeah. just like pushed a mountain of books in front of me. Once you were reading, yeah, yeah, right. Which and was, you know, I it was late. It was late. Yeah, I remember doing Book It. Did you ever do Book It? Mm, that sounds familiar. But I think it was when I was homeschooled. Still, but we were able to participate in this Book It program, and you could read a certain number of books, and then you would get a certain... Oh, at the library, maybe? Yeah, you would get tokens or tickets that translated to slices of pizza at Pizza Hut. Oh, you're kind of reminding me, I think. Book It. I think it was called Book It. And Mm -hmm. it was... uh, Hmm. So it was bribery. And (laughs) I remember being, uh, you know, a mature youth. (laughs) Nine? Probably nine. Turning in like those cardboard <laughs> chewable books for that. All right? Not a joke. It's so funny. You know those chewable books that babies have? You know? See, pat, run. Those ones? Yeah, I had a stack of those puppies. Turned them in and got slices of pizza. And they gave them to me because nobody cares, right? It's all quantity, not quality. Sorry. I can just imagine what your mom did. She know that that's what you were probably. Doing? Yeah, she's she was she was <laughs> she great. gave up by then. Yeah, she. I don't know. She really learned how not to worry about it. <laughs> yes, yeah. and uh, it was it worked mm-hmm. out because you know I I don't know. I mean, I honestly that was my reading level, and then I feel like when I was twelve, I took a class that was way over my head. Because uh, mm. there were a group in this homeschooling group I was a part of. There was a, you know, a, a parents would raise their hand and offer a class oh. for other kids. Uh, whether it was a literature class or someone that works in biology would offer a biology class. And like then, a co-op. Yeah, it was a co-op. Mm-hmm. It was great. And so one of them was um, the three Theban plays. So I went from 
literally chewable cardboard books <laughs> oh, to yes. when I was, uh, I think I was 12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, reading Antigone. Wow, yeah. And the three Theban plays and reading Oedipus Rex and not really getting it mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. But uh, that doesn't matter. I was reading it and I was, I remember the whole class was over my head. What the teacher was saying was over my head. What I was reading in the books was over my head. Mm -hmm. But um, I went through it. And the other neat thing about a homeschooling environment is that I was in this... There were only three of us in the class. And one of (laughs) them was was 16, super Mm -hmm. genius, Mm -hmm. 16-year-old kid, because we have lots of super geniuses in the homeschool community. Mm -hmm. And then me, I was a little guy, Mm -hmm. and then someone just a little older than me, you Mm -hmm. know? So just a small little, you know, we probably only met like four (laughs) times or something, but, Mm. and that was big. I, for some reason, that experience of reading above my head without comprehension, Mm. uh, but with uh, this, it it wooed me. It was like, Mm -hmm. whoa, Mm -hmm. there is a lot going on out there. Yeah. It calls you up. Yeah. It calls Mm -hmm. you up. Mm Mm-hmm. And actually disciplining yourself to read something that's almost a different language. You're just mm. like, man, I'm not. What am I? He, wait, what? He gouged his eyes out? Why? <laughs> why did they leave him as a baby on a rock? Like, why did they nail his heel to a mountain? You know, it's just like, what on yeah, earth? Wait, yeah. that's his mom? You know, it was so yeah. weird. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person I've heard recently that said that that story is the one that inspired them to be whatever it was they became. Like oh. a famous actor. I think it was John Rhys Davies. Oh, really? Yeah. Talking about Oedipus? That's right. He or said Antigone? That's when he knew he wanted to be, well, at the time he wanted to be a, a writer, a playwright. Yeah. And then he ended up becoming an actor. But that ah. that's what inspired him was that story. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, <clears throat> that is the prototype according to Aristotle. Oh, okay. And the poetics of tragedy. Okay. That's and, why. Yeah, yeah. It, because you can, read, you can read that story or, watch, you know, even better, watch it as a play because it is a play. Mm. And uh, you can go through uh, extreme anguish <laughs> yeah. because it is such a horrible story. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just a play. Like, it's not even real. Yeah. And you yeah. have been to hell and back yeah. inside. Yeah. It's huh. horribly wonderful. <laughs> but um so that was and, and from then on it was literature for me and i remember the first book i really connected with was harper lee was t- uh, to kill a mockingbird right i read it like four times mm. and it made me weep every time mm. could not believe that mm. book mm-hmm. and this is all like 13 14 15 mm-hmm. uh quo Vadis was big for me by enrique shankovitz actually that's Sankovic. It's a Polish name. I right. always pronounce it wrong. But yeah. Um and then I long story short, just high school was again lots of reading. I only went really through what we would call geometry. Mm-hmm. And had we kind of caught on to it a little earlier, I think the the philosophy of mathematics would have been, you know, reading actually reading Pythagoras. If I could have come come at mathematics from a philosophical bent. Mm-hmm. I would have actually been way mm-hmm. more into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of reading. And then I graduated mm-hmm. when I was 17. So I took whatever that test is that you take in California to graduate and mm-hmm. went straight to college. And I tested out of all the silly like uh, gen ed remedial yeah. classes they want you to take at college, mm-hmm. even the math one. Hmm. which surprised me. I kind of thought it was a fluke for a while. (laughs) Um, Hmm. And just went right into college and there was no hiccup for me. I did really well at college. Mm -hmm. No hiccup at all. And, you know, because honestly, the homeschooling schedule was more akin, excuse me, to a small college experience. Oh, right. That's true. Than it is to a a huge public school experience. And Mm -hmm. I I did go to a small college. Mm -hmm. Um. And I ended up being an English major. So from, you know, uh, cardboard books to the guy that I read the most was John Milton, Mm -hmm. who wrote a 10,500 plus line epic poem Mm -hmm. in English uh, called Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. And 
studied him some more in graduate school when I and I got my master's degree in English lit. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was a late reader. I barely made it through geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, again, because it was useless. I didn't get it because it made, didn't. Like, I just eye stuff. I don't need to graph it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that with the, you know, for me, I was, I was below average. <laughs> My friends, crazy. The, when you unleash education for people, meaning when you disburden them of learning stupid, useless things and obliging them to do it, mm. then the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. I mean... I had friends double majoring in biochemistry and English. Um, Homeschool kids. And pre-law. Yeah, yeah, graduating yeah. when they were 16, 15, and starting college right away. Mm -hmm. Most of my friends, in fact, graduated high school early and uh, went into uh, junior college to get mm -hmm. their gen ed requirements out of the way and then went to a university or something, mm -hmm. which is a little weird. I don't think you... I don't mean to imply that the point of homeschooling is to do stuff fast and be a genius. It's actually not at all the yeah. point. That yeah. is not what it's about. Yeah. And I'm actually grateful that I didn't waste my time at a JC. Mm -hmm. And I got to go to a, a nice little college that I really mm -hmm. liked uh, instead and did gen mm -hmm. ed stuff there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's true. But... Yeah, my whole experience is wonderful. It's what I'm familiar with. So uh, sending my kids to school would be a new uncharted territory for me mm -hmm. that actually gives me anxiety. That freaks me out because mm -hmm. I don't understand school. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Yeah. Um, but I'm very comfortable with uh, everyone learning at different rates. You know, yeah. very. I had friends that didn't read till they were 13. Mm-hmm. And then they go on and they like start translating works in Latin, you know, in college mm -hmm. or, or they, they're taking Greek and mm -hmm. Hebrew. Like it's not the timing thing, the pressure yeah. to progress incrementally through, yeah, useless curricula. It's just total, there, don't do that. It's there, such yeah. a waste. You don't need to do that. There's a saying that in the homeschool crowd that I look at. Uh, schools of thought that say better late than early mm, mm -hmm. because forcing someone to fit into a certain time frame is a surefire way to make them hate it or keep them back from flourishing so yeah for me it's actually been an unschooling kind of yeah uh, i mean i i wouldn't say i'm an unschooler because that that's the name of us it's hard to know, like, if our audience, how familiar they are with, with yeah. homeschooling. But there's lots of schools of thought. Yeah. And one of them is actually called unschooling, uh -huh. where you kind of have to undo things that, habits that you get in at school. Uh -huh. um, or even, I guess, at the extreme, unschoolers kind of throw caution to the wind and they don't uh -huh. have any structure at right. all. And they kind of rely on the child's innate desire to learn um and I, I i sympathize with parts of the unschooling yeah uh, methodology i'm not fully on board but um and i've kind of come a long way too but i was definitely a straight a i was valedictorian mm -hmm. i was like by the book 100 <laughs> percent, you know and so i i think i would err you know if i hadn't had I'm, i've come so full circle in so many ways that i'm uh, but I've had to undo a lot of yeah. um, oppressive structures that mm. were kind of built into me by the school system. So, yeah. um, but anyway, I don't know why I was going on that. Yeah. Well, it seems do. like that school program, it, it favors the dutiful, you know, mm. if you can, if you can be dutiful and, uh, and those who want to get a good grade mm -hmm. uh, or want approval mm -hmm. and, if those things just innately don't matter to you at all, and yeah. I'm not saying they didn't matter to me, like I, I definitely felt sure. that in college and stuff, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a really hard time in school. Yeah. Um, if you can't see the reason for that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Um, 
Oh, yeah. So mm. unschooling was explored by the film Captain Fantastic. Someone uh, has yes. mentioned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. you know we were in Captain Fantastic? We have a history with this movie. <laughs> Watch the end credits. Mm -hmm. We're in there. I yeah. I just one day we got a call from a Hollywood producer with purple hair, and because they uh, filmed it in our region, they filmed it in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, in our state, like yeah. you know, two hours away. Yeah, if you want to see where they live with them fir trees and ferns and huckleberries, that's it. That's what we live in. Yeah. And it's kind of damp. Uh, but <laughs> they, we got a call and they wanted uh, the daughters, uh, who the girls, the actresses that played the daughters in the film, to come and skin a, a lamb to yeah. learn how to be able to skin a deer. Yeah. Which I think they do for like 0.5 seconds of a panning shot in the opening <laughs> scenes. The skinning a deer. There's a few more moments than that, but Are yeah, there? Okay. It, it was really short compared with the time you took with them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was it was interesting. I mean, they came with an entourage. They literally had monkeys or I don't know. I don't want to be too condescending, but eh, a little bit. Uh, guys <laughs> holding umbrellas over the girls. Uh, and it was yeah. a sunny day. Yeah, they had to really kind of cater to these child... Well, they're child actors, so I'm sure there's all kinds of laws that they have to... Yeah, you know. it was funny. It was weird. But, the you know, <laughs> the girls were... Uh, they got to skin... I, I walked them through the skinning of a lamb. Yeah. So that they could have that skill. Well, so, And I showed them specifically the fisting. If you want to look that's right, yeah. like you've done this before, you're not knifing off every inch. Yeah. You're getting in the seam and you're going to be fisting and pushing it off. And they did show that. And in they the movie. did. Yeah. yeah, they did it. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. Well, that movie, I didn't like a lot of it, but the mm -hmm. beginning parts were kind of accurate to a homeschooling, family based, you know, just nuclear family, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Like the activities that the kids were doing hmm. are mm -hmm. not that far off from what our kids kind of do. No. They just find themselves making a fire or. Yeah. Getting a rabbit, or I don't know. Right. Yeah, we things we don't we don't actually have to programatize that stuff. Right. Like I don't teach my yes. sons to do any of it. Like that. outdoor education. No, no, no. And no. That's natural. <laughs> they just do it. Some of family friends that we have, they say that their science program is the fact that they have a farm, and that's it. That's what they do for science. Yeah. That, right. So that she doesn't feel like she has to sit down and like give them a science. No. textbook at all i know i agree I mean, yeah dissection come on yeah it's all over the place you can yeah <laughs> um, but yeah i wish that movie film was more present to my memory because i didn't like it did you even and finish I'm, it i couldn't I, even finish it i finished it and i told you i was disappointed with it yeah because it was rather nihilistic yeah um definitely atheistic uh -huh. and um materialistic yeah. he was just a well no. yeah <laughs> i don't I want think... to get too far i don't know it wasn't um yeah. the advice that he gave to his son before he left to go to college mm -hmm. was disappointing it yeah. felt rather minimal mm -hmm. oh and then they they buried the mom in a toilet uh. Yeah, so no, it, cool. it was really disappointing. Like, I, I have a higher view of the human person than that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's some fundamental differences, I think. But but the, it was fun to see his that homeschooling worked. I mean, all his kids were bright, bright-eyed, healthy, yeah. vigorous, you know, specimens right. of the human race. Yeah, so. I guess the, the general thing that the, the underlying, one of them, and I can't remember it that well, but the underlying assumption of that movie was uh, that homeschooling is rebellious. Mm. It is countercultural. Mm. It is the ultimate stick it to the man mm. thing. And it might be that, but good grief. Like, uh, there's only so far that will get you. I just mm. don't have that much resentment and mm. rebelliousness. Those are not good motivations. For the selfless gift of uh, taking on the burden of educating your children. Mm, it's mm -hmm. not going to fly. You're going to burn out. Mm. It was too gratifying for him. Mm. He was arrogant. Yeah, It was true. like, look at my, uh, you know, 
this is what I do because I am great. Mm-hmm. These are my great kids, and it's uh, that. That's not how it is. That's not how it is <laughs> in real life. You find out who you are when you're in right. school. That's <laughs> right. If you seek mortification, hmm. dare to live with your children all the time <laughs> and homeschool them. Yeah. Um, yes, because you're not just teaching them. You're right. you're teaching yourself all of these core habits. Yeah. Um, and you come you you come straight up against reality. Yeah. With when who was it? I think it was Pope Benedict actually that said education is the meeting of two freedoms. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's right. scary stuff. Yeah. Right? Because if you believe that you are free and your child is free. Yeah. Ooh. It's it's that's a tough thing. Yeah. It you gotta swallow your pride so much. Yeah. And that's that's really hard to do. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, they mentioned Mosquito Coast, too. That's another good example of that. Coming from a negative, bitter place. Yeah. Oh, is that a movie? With Harrison Ford. Did you ever see that? No. It's spooky. It's, oh. it's not fun, but it's, oh, okay. it's intense. Hmm. It's a good one. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, David asked a good question. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know Andrew homeschools his kids, too. Mm. And he's, mm. you know, he, they've <laughs> missed the cancellation of outdoor activities, youth symphony and choir. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Our, I think we're kind of lucky. Our kid, our oldest is 10. Yeah. So we don't have a ton of that, but it's also kind of the off season right now. We are missing baseball. We're missing baseball. And we are, we were doing Wednesday homeschool co-op, which yeah. included, I have to say, choir, which yeah. is the, one of the biggest things that I'm missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah those are bummers. Mm-hmm. And then David asked, uh, was curious if you use a lot of technology with your children. It's mm. a good question. Mm-hmm. His, his son is four, uh, and he's been asking more and more to use the cell phone uh, to watch videos. What are your thoughts here? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> 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 We're going to come down on that side pretty rigidly, I am afraid. Yeah. Before we do, do anything, say anything negative, though, yeah. I will say I use audiobooks like yeah. quite liberally that's great so that and that's in the afternoon after i've had the bulk of the book time and the kids are a little fried maybe yeah. and i need some quiet time we call it quiet time yeah. and every kid needs a little bit of that just lay in bed like i almost have to chain them to the bed it's really because our kids are so active yeah so um but they do actually need a little quiet time. And so for 40 minutes, they're in their room. And I did have to relent at one point and say, okay, you don't have to be in complete silence. You have about an audio book. And mm-hmm. so I have a um, subscription to Audible. And um, I also did just subscribe to another very homeschool type um, business, Jim Hodges. He does GA Henty books. Mm on audio and some other um, very historical historical fiction historical fiction that's how i learned a lot of my history growing up exactly my mom just pushed historical fiction at me yeah so and and i'm i'm plugged into a lot of the reading aloud communities online and they all say audiobooks are their lifesaver yeah moment um so that i do rely on technology for that yeah and beyond that you and I, you know, we'll do a family movie night on Saturday nights. Yeah. But and I think that the audiobooks is building off of the core of uh, what you do for homeschooling, which is reading to the kids. Yes, that's a that's pillar. That's huge. Yeah. It, and they beg for it all the time. Mm-hmm. Even our 10-year-old, all of them, except for Therese. Yeah. She's a little young. Oh, even then. Even her? Yeah, well, you know, oh, the kid, the older kids are actually starting to finally start reading, and they yeah. can read those chewable cardboard books to the baby girls. So Pizza time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's even they're getting, you know, and they don't even read, mm-hmm. but they're even Mary, I saw today, she's five, and she has a book, and she can't read it quite 
she, well, she can a little bit. Yeah. But she just likes to sit on mm-hmm. the couch and look through a picture book. Mm-hmm. And I think that's building good habits, if nothing mm-hmm. else. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've always read to the kids. And that's why I, I, I like the audiobooks. They build yes. off of their apprehension of story. And, yeah. And then all the other things that they And they verbally... Verbally, um, I mean, you just look up any yeah. science, it'll tell you that hearing books, hearing words, hearing from a baby, right? It's like Mozart to a baby's oh, ears. It's huge. Like yeah. you just, their verbal skills later when they're adults um, is off the charts. Yeah. And it's, it's, it, it, it's, pred- it's a predictor of all the good outcomes that you want for your kids. Yeah. Is reading aloud will give you. Mm-hmm. But the thing about technology, I would have to say, you know, is it doesn't work. <laughs> it's yeah. It's a siren song. And mm. honestly, like, if I am in a crisis at some point and I need to, like, I don't know what that crisis would be, but I have turned on a show once in a while. Mm-hmm. I, I do reserve that for crisis the moments. The babysitter. It kind of is. And the, <laughs> sometimes when we have our family pig class, I get to that moment where your mom needs to actually prepare some meals for people. Yeah. And the kids love it. They know exactly yeah. it's coming, you know. But so they can watch a show for regular life. I really, I had to make a decision because I was getting to the point where I would, I would give the kids something to look forward to. Like, okay, yeah. four thirty every day, mom's gonna make dinner, and you can watch a show. Yeah, that's what we would call it—a little uh-huh. show. Uh-huh. But the little show turned into a medium show, uh-huh. and then the little medium show turned into a movie, and then mm-hmm. it was just, and then I would be hearing about them. What movie are we going to watch, Mom? Like from nine a.m., I'd be hearing yeah. about it, and it would ruin my day mm-hmm. and their day. They mm-hmm. were not happy either, so yeah. I really do reserve it for rare occasions. Yeah, and they are better off for it, and they they Definitely. don't even they don't know it, but they are. Yeah, so we. We don't let them, our oldest is 10, like I say, he's going to be 11 on the 4th of May. And he can't get on the computer or look at a phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, those are just the house rules. Mm-hmm. All the, the technology is locked. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say it's, it's not just for their sake. You know, it is like a buffer. It's, it's uh, what do you call it? It's... Um, it's belt and braces a little bit, mm-hmm. you know. It seems a little overkill, but it's not just that they would have a tendency to be addicted to the screen, which is a given, right? Mm-hmm. That's why they beg for it from nine a.m. Mm-hmm. You know, if we have if mm-hmm. if we have to utilize it too much, to just immediately get addicted. It's never enough. They always want more. So again, it's the opposite of freedom. They're enslaved by their desire for it. It's also because we as parents can get addicted mm-hmm. to them being mm. babysat by the screen. Yeah. And that's like, I think it's, you made me think of this when you said it's a siren song. Mm. You know, it's that you can, uh, you can take a break, put the kid on the screen. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just, it's, it's too tempting to avail yourself of that over and over and over mm-hmm. again mm-hmm. to the neglect of your responsibility to educate them and train mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And I feel that always. And that's, I think that's a lot of where the battle is with the technology mm-hmm. um, is, is to not utilize it for that. Yeah. Um, and again, that doesn't mean it's like, instead of watching a show, we're sitting down and we're doing 15 math problems and reading four books. Yeah. It's just, they're not there when they're watching the screen. They're not present. Mm-hmm. And if they're present in your home, on your property, uh, in the context of the family, of uh, you know, just a relatively ordered domestic life, that is school. Mm-hmm. That they are learning. Mm-hmm. They are being formed. They are learning to not be slaves to their likes and dislikes and their whims. Mm-hmm. And, their lower nature yeah i mean it it, just living in this world they're gonna get some screen time yeah (laughs) eventually like it's gonna happen yeah so um and i know it's we're getting ever close to it with our oldest and he's almost 11 yeah and so i know we have maybe just a couple more years 
until he realizes how talented he is that he actually can read and <laughs> <laughs> like it it's gonna st- i mean even just the other day i was kind of tempted to be like could you look this thing up for me because i uh-huh. need to know and i'm stuck over here but uh-huh. i didn't you know because i know that's just pandora's box but i'm really glad that we have fought yeah. that battle and because pre- it once they're 14 or whatever like they're not looking back. It's not like they're going to be opened up to the screen and then somehow t- like t- not have a reason to use it. It's yeah. coming, you know. Well, and it's uh, I also can't think of a reason for them to use it. I, I just can't right. like why? What do they need? Mm-hmm. Their life is so real right in front of them. Uh yeah. it would only be from because I desire to be left alone. Yeah. So I'll put them on the screen. Yeah. And I might retrogressively justify that by saying, oh, it's an educational program. Mm-hmm. But yeah. they're not learning anything. Yeah. It's not really. I mean, I imagine that when we finally do introduce our kids to using technology, I'm going to want to help teach them, you use this for work mm-hmm. or education. And that's pretty much it. You don't use this to relax. Well, it's... Yeah, that's... Yeah. You know? Unless it's in the context of like a family movie. But especially, I don't know, for young men, like idleness with a screen. Yeah, that's bad news. That's kind of asking for it. So, and that's to say nothing of all the filters that you absolutely do need to get your kids on Mm -hmm. right now. But... Yeah. um, And and I say that, which sounds really kind of rigorous... But it also has been the best thing for me, too. Yeah. Because now, all of a sudden, I don't want them just seeing mom looking at her phone mm-hmm. in my off time. Mm-hmm. Be- and and so that has helped because I don't want them to see me doing a bad habit. I'm like, well, maybe, why should I be doing this anyway? It's yeah. a bad habit for mm-hmm. me, too, not just for my kids. Mm-hmm. But, um, and so I've had to really catch myself you know, from heading in that direction Mm -hmm. because I don't want my kids. So yeah, it's a double standard, Mm -hmm. you know, if I don't want them looking at the screen too much, but I am willy nilly with it myself. Yeah. But yeah, I would say it served us well having that kind of approach. This conversation will be continued in a forthcoming part two episode. Thanks for listening and peace be with you.